All righty. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Saturday, Reef Fest Saturday. Woohoo! Great weather. Sounds like everybody had a nice time on the water for those of you lucky enough to get out there. So, yay. Um, we're really excited to have this seminar today. We've been um, working with Dan for the last couple of years almost, year and a half at least, um, doing some really neat things with reef data. And so, we're excited to have him here all the way from Canada. Um, they let him out, so that was nice. Um, before we introduce Dan, though, I just want to um, remind everybody that we've got the For the Love of the Sea is tonight. If you don't yet have a, a ticket, nobody actually has a physical ticket, so your name is on the list, so we'll see you there. But if you haven't bought a ticket yet, you can just show up at the event, um, and we'll, you can buy a ticket at the door. So if you have questions about that, just ask any of us after this event. Um, it's the doors, there's no physical doors, the doors open at 4.30, um, the bar will be open, food will start being available at 5. Um, and that event is at mile marker 103 on Bayside, right north of the quiescence dive shop. So there'll be parking uh, there to assist with parking, there'll be folks park, kind of showing you where to park. It's a little limited, so if you are, have an opportunity to carpool, that would be great, but it, it's not, it's not too bad. Um, well, it's all outdoors. We'll have, um, an, like I said, an open bar. We'll do the sunset picture. And it'll be a little different for those of you who have been to this event in the past. It's not a everybody's going to be seated and have kind of served meals. It's going to be food stations I'll open for a lot longer. So kind of you'll be able to get a little bite to eat. You'll be able to eat. Then you can roam around. Um, so there won't be any formal seating. There is seats and tables. But um, it won't be like, I want to save this seat for the whole night. So um, if you do need a seat, of course, have a seat. Um, but it's, it's a little more um, COVID friendly, the format for this year. So still in that beautiful place. We've had great weather. So we look forward to seeing everyone there. Um, just a real quick one more time. Thank you to David Hartman. It really, we've gotten such great feedback with the feed, with the live feeds going out on Facebook and YouTube, really opening up, you know, we've get great speakers every year to this event and to be able to broaden the audience beyond what is a, who are able just to be here has been, we're so grateful. So we really appreciate his professionalism and putting, putting it out. And Jana Nichols and Claude Nichols, they are showing up early each time, helping us set up all the things and working with Daryl. So I really appreciate all you guys. Um, making sure that we're getting the technology all figured out. Um, so that's great. So I think we'll turn it over. I'm going to turn it over to Bryce, and he's going to introduce Dan, and we'll get, get to hear what he has to say. Okay. Um, hi, my friends. Uh, I'm going to be really brief on this. I wanted to introduce Dan Greenberg. Dan uh, it was formerly, formerly uh, a postdoctoral research scholar in my lab at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, but of course... That's towards the very back end of his academic illustrious career. Dan started 
uh, his academic career at the University of Guelph, where he did an uh, undergrad in wildlife and fisheries ecology. Uh, he moved on to McGill University, where he did something with creatine. Is that right? Okay, I don't even care. Stop talking. So he did that. It has nothing to do with ecology, but fortunately, he came back to our world of ecology and uh, and and evolutionary biology, and that is where uh, Dan has firmly placed his foot in in the scientific world. Dan is a polymath, meaning that he has interest and expertise in a huge amount of things, including but not limited to natural resource uh, um, biology, natural history, as well as uh, evolutionary biology, and importantly for us, statistical ecology. And all of that made him an ideal candidate to start to, to um, embrace the world of the data that we all collect, which is both abundant and very messy. Uh, and, and that combination is both powerful and scary, and it requires statistics. And Dan uh, was uniquely suited to, to bring his uh, academic expertise to bear in a statistically rigorous way to the data that we have in hand. Um, before arriving in, on our doorstep, Dan had, and continues to, publish in journals such as Science, Nature, Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, Proc B. That just sounds fancy, doesn't it? Right? Uh, ecology Letters. So his pedigree is, is already on the trajectory of, of uh, academic superstars. So we were very lucky to have Dan uh, participate in, in our science. And I think the way we wrote him in is because we have generated a huge amount of information that has been largely untapped. And what Dan is gonna talk about today is the beginnings of some pretty amazing research, pretty amazing findings that distills what we have done over the last 30 years into some very interesting uh, ecosystem ecology. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll let Dan fill us in on all of the details. Thank you, Bryce. Everyone can hear me all right? Great. Uh, as Bryce mentioned, I've spent the past year and a half or so trying to dig into the data that you guys are collecting. And as he also alluded to, I'm a little bit of a fish out of water. So I was actually quite excited to finally get down here and come to the Florida Keys after staring at computer screens for a year and a half that maybe represent this place. Uh, and this place is really iconic as an ecosystem. It's rich, it's complex, but it's also iconic because it faces pretty immense human pressures. This isn't unique to the Florida Keys, but it represents really the state of much of the world. Humans have basically taken over all ecosystems everywhere. There's very few places where our impacts aren't felt. This is a human footprint index. Very few places are left wild. So everywhere around the world, ecosystems are under human pressures. And it doesn't just extend to the land, but we've also taken over the sea, of course. This is fishing pressure across the world. Pretty much nowhere is left that hasn't and felt our, our impacts, and not just our direct impacts, but of course the indirect effects of things like climate change. So a major question in biodiversity science, of course, and conservation is, well, given that humans are now the masters of, of the world and engineering ecosystems all over the place, how are other species actually faring? To answer this question, we need this piece of data. This is a population time series. This is measuring abundance of a species uh, in a given place over time. So you can see that populations, of course, change. We can sort of quantify this with some simple models. So in, for instance, we know that a population at, in a given year is gonna depend on what it was the last year, minus some rate of change that represents the births and deaths of individuals into that population. From this, we can calculate, okay, what's the sort of rate of change of that population over time? And we can use these square equations to then estimate, well, what's actually the long-term change in abundance? This is the population trend. And this is sort of a key piece of information to assess how these populations are actually doing. The problem though, is that getting this sort of data, surveying animal populations repeatedly over time is very hard. It takes a lot of effort and it costs a lot of money. So these data are actually relatively rare. Despite this though, people have gone to great lengths to accumulate all this data together. There's a couple of major big data approaches uh, to this sort of population time series data. These are the two biggest ones. One's this biotime database that has millions of records. Most of these aren't actually abundance though, they're just species presence absence over time. And then the other one is this living planet index, which some of you might be familiar with. 
uh, where this is population abundance from all these sites all over the world. So all these dots represent populations in this case. And people have been analyzing this data sets to really ask, okay, what's the sort of big picture level of change? And the sort of surprising thing is that repeatedly people have been finding this. So this is population change and a histogram. So this is the sort of density of these different values. Uh, so everything on the right is a population that's growing right at this dashed line. Everything on the left is a population that's declining. And the sort of weird thing, given we know that humans have had these pretty immense impacts on all these different communities, is that overall, the, the situation is that they appear to be stable, at least in aggregate. Now, that doesn't mean species are declining. In fact, there's many species declining and many populations, but it seems like for every population or species that's declining, there's another one increasing. And this seems to be true no matter what taxonomic group you look at here on the left or what ecosystem or biome you look at on the right. This isn't limited just to this biotime data set, however. You also find the same thing in the Living Planet Index. So with all these populations, uh, they all seem to even out to be you know, approximately balanced overall. Needless to say, these results have been very controversial. Uh, there's reasons to be su suspect about it. And I think part of the reason has to do with representation. So the populations that, uh, and species that we tend to have data for, uh, that, this long-term time series data, they're really quite biased towards certain particular species. These are species we like to hunt or fish. These are species that are typically, well, wide ranging um, or that live in protected areas where they're not facing the same levels of human pressure as your average species in most of the world. And this map on the right here shows you sort of where the most species are for terrestrial vertebrates in these dark red patches and compare that to where most of the populations are. Unsurprisingly, they're mostly in relatively unbiodiverse regions in the temperate zones where uh, people have more money to actually invest in this. So we're getting a pretty biased view of how the earth is actually changing right now based on this existing data. To really illustrate this, uh, these are some sort of plots that show uh, the number of species within a given group and then how many species have time series data in the Living Planet Index. So these lines indicate different levels of representation, so 1%, 5%, 10%. And this is for terrestrial systems or marine systems. And the thing to notice about this is that really for most of these groups, they're down here. They're below 10% of species that have any data at all. A little, it may look a little bit better in marine realms, but the groups that have good representation are really small. There's not that many marine reptiles. There's not that many Arctic mammals, but lots of the things that are very diverse, we basically have very, very little data on. Now, even for the species we do have data on, the data tends to be not very good. So the value of a time series is how long it runs for. That gives us a more accurate measure of how the population is changing. But most of them fall within this pretty short time range, about five to 10, or less than about five to 10 years. Um, you can't get very much information from this. So even worse is that when you go to species in very biodiverse regions that are going to be facing some of the most immense threats right now, the data is really, really bad. For all of the neotropics, Central and South America, 500 populations, 300 species, most of these are about two or three years of data. This is really not uh, efficient to, to estimate population trends. For other biodiverse regions like Southeast Asia, it's even worse, 271. Uh, the areas that we are most concerned about, we don't have a, any idea about what's going on, essentially. There was a very interesting recent review of population monitoring programs. What they found was sort of interesting. So unsurprisingly, high income countries have more investment from the government in population monitoring schemes. The other segments here are academic programs to monitor populations, NGOs, uh, and, and various other organizations. But we're gonna focus on the government one here. So of course, high income uh, countries have more investment in population monitoring. Low and middle income companies, uh, <laughs> countries rather, uh, have very little government investment. These are also the places that have most of the world's biodiversity and probably the most threatened bit. What's even worse is that the uh, long-term trend for government investment over time, so this is before 2002 and then this is earlier, is actually going down in many places. 
So not only is the is government funding not sufficient currently for monitoring our biodiversity, but it doesn't look like it's going to be compensating for it. This underscores again that for most places, we just have little or no long-term data. We really are in a biodiversity data crisis, which probably also reflects the overall biodiversity crisis. This is where I think citizen science is, coming, is going to be coming in and making a very big impact. There's a number of citizen science initiatives, here's just a few, that are now operating at really vast scales. And they're gonna play a very important role in filling in this massive data gap. To illustrate this, birds are really the best surveyed group. This plot shows the sort of increases of records of birds in the, in, uh, the great uh, biodiversity data sets. And uh, the shaded area here is just the, the records that are attributable to one of the major citizen science program initiatives, which is eBird. So if you look over time, if you took out the shaded area, so those would be these dashed lines, it barely changes. All of this, all of this gain in the records is all coming from citizen science. And this, prog this particular program has taken off immensely. And what's very interesting about it is if you actually compare eBird records uh, that have uh, uh, contributed to uh, GBIF, which is a biodiversity sort of col data collation program, uh, it's massively expanded the scope of geographic representation around the globe when you compare it to just the Living Planet Index, where, again, the populations are highly concentrated in only a small number of areas. Uh, which are generally the temperate north. But this opportunistic citizen science data also comes with important caveats. So to think about this, we really have to compare how we traditionally sort of measure population abundance over time in a sort of structured survey that a government agency might run versus citizen science that's generally opportunistic. People go where they want, and do it in the way that they want and sort of generate the data opportunistically. So of course, in a systematic survey, you're trying to keep effort constant. So a set number of time that you'd survey a site for to count individuals. Uh, but in citizen science, effort can be highly variable. Some people may go out for several hours. Uh, some people may just actually literally put in more effort to observing things. Uh, and so it's quite potentially variable, which of course is gonna affect how we measure things like what abundance of, of the species that you find in that area. In structured surveys, we try and randomize the sampling so that's representative of the area. So you're not only biasing yourself towards going to areas where you think you're gonna find it and of course get higher abundance estimates, but you go everywhere to get a sense of where it's doing across all these different places. In opportunistic surveys, well, sampling is not random. It's determined by human behavior where people want to go. People often want to go to sites where they know they're going to find things. So the sampling is, is quite messy, but uh, and that, that potentially could int introduce problems. In structured surveys, generally you try and make it so that observers are highly trained uh, they, and that this in turn sort of minimizes differences in, abil in their ability to observe uh, individuals out in the wild. Um, Citizen science survey, of course, observability is gonna be highly variable. Uh, you can compare my reef survey from yesterday to Bryce's and just see that for a good, very good example. And so structured surveys are finally kind of have sampling designs to reduce all these human induced biases. But in citizen science data and opportunistic data, the human behavior and biases are really baked into it. So many people have used this sort of problem to say, well, citizen science, isn't gonna be really useful for ecological modeling. But people have actually asked this uh, in a, as a sort of scientific question and compared, okay, if we take citizen science data that's collected opportunistically and compare it to a, some sort of reference structured survey, uh, like a government sponsored uh, monitored survey, you know, what do we actually find? There's been several studies of this in birds and insects where they're really some of the more better studied groups. This is probably the largest study. Uh, this was with eBird data uh, collected for a very large number of species, about 8,000, uh, comparing it to sort of like population trends uh, from BirdLife International. So these are sort of coarse categorical trends. So basically they're saying, okay, if you see a trend in eBird where it's going up, does this agree with what BirdLife International says about this species? Is it also increasing or is it stable or is it decreasing? <laughs> 
So overall, the agreement is only about 40% between citizen science data and these estimates. It gets even worse when you start looking at sort of species across different measures, for instance, uh, how threatened they are. So it does okay job for the sort of common and abundant species that aren't particularly threatened. But for highly threatened species, so these are near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered species, the agreement in terms of the population trend gets even worse. So this isn't exactly a ringing endorsement, but really we have to evaluate each program separately. And although birds receive a lot of attention, people like to look at them. People also like to look at fish, but not only that, fish are really important. So what's going on? We have to consider as well that many people around the globe, millions, probably billions of people in fact, rely on this resource and these species for food and for income. And we know that most of those harvested species, they don't have data and they aren't being monitored for the vast majority of stocks. And if you consider actually the just total marine biodiversity, so not even just the fish that we harvest, but also those that just exist in the ecosystem, it gets even worse. Those assessed fish stocks are really about 1% of marine biodiversity. This isn't very uh, comforting. But we also know that when you have data and you can use this data for management, we do a better job at keeping these stocks sustainable and making them last longer and not over exploiting species. So we really need to start utilizing this data and evaluating it and see whether or not it lines up. And of course, we have this resource now with the reef data. So the Volunteer Fish Survey Project is really old for a citizen science project, really old. I don't know if you notice on the, on the eBird ones, but you know, that went live in the you know, mid 20, around 2010, 2008. Reef data is go, goes back all the way back to 1993. It's a, mass, a massive data set, globally about nearly 10 million records. And within the tropical Western Atlantic region, there's almost 8 million records alone. This is a massive biodiversity data set, one of the largest for our oceans. And it all started here, down in the Keys, which is also very interesting because this place has, of course, changed a lot. It's a, obviously a massive draw for people for the amazing diving here, um, but these reefs haven't exactly had an easy time for, since very the, big, the very beginning. A really interesting study looked at British nautical maps from the 1770s. And from this, they were able to find, okay, where had these naval captains sort of mapped out coral reefs across the Keys. And based on this, they were able to compare it to sort of current benthic habitat maps and show that there's been really massive losses of coral, which probably isn't too surprising, um, particularly in Florida Bay, nearly 90%. But even all the other parts of this, uh, there's been very large declines in coral cover. Now, most of these are seagrass or bare substrate. Of course, it's not just that since you know, the 1770s that things have gotten particularly bad, but they continue to do so, as many people here have actually personally witnessed. So coral cover has continued to decline from mass bleaching events, disease outbreaks, um, all sorts of factors that have contributed to this. This photo in particular paint, paints a pretty uh, pale picture of how things have changed. And it's not just in coral cover, but also, of course, in the composition. So things are changing really fast here. And of course, we need to know how the fish uh, species are changing in tandem. And it's very interesting because the Florida Keys is one of the really well-surveyed places for the marine ecosystems. So NOAA, back in 1979, initiated a first sort of population monitoring protocol. So this is a structured survey. This is the reef visual census. And so this gives us a really long-term look uh, with a sort of calibrated structured survey going back in time. Now what they do in the reef visual census is they've sort of divvied up all the coral into these different habitat categories. So things like spur and groove, uh, patch reefs, or a contiguous reef or rubble. And they sort of use a stratified random sampling design to randomly put down sites across these different habitat categories. And send, what they do is send down a pair of divers to count all the fish that they observe in about 15 to 20 minute period in a circular plot that spans about 15 meters in diameter. And we can use this to basically calibrate and test whether or not the reef data agrees. 
But really, we have to think about how these data structures compare. So as I said, the RVC has these stationary circular plots, so the divers are staying there, and they're canting whatever comes close enough to them. They're not moving around. Reef, of course, you're moving around, hopefully. Um, it has a limited observation window that's sort of set at a certain time, so there's a sort of constant effort. Of course, your dive time's going to vary, but we also have that data. For each of those grid cells where they do sort of a, a overall sampling point, they do about two to four of these sort of smaller scale circular plots within it. Uh, dive locations, of course, are gonna be highly variable. Um, some are gonna be visited quite frequently, others are gonna be visited infrequently. But again, we have all this data recorded. And in RBC, there's do, they're doing counts, you know, continuously. So it could be zero, it could be 11, it could be 53. Um, and Reef has a sort of different data structure, as you guys are going to be familiar with, where it's binned into categories. So zero, one, two to 10, 11 to 100, or 100 plus. So it's slightly different data structures. But we can account for some of these things and actually build it into how we study it. So the very cool thing is that we can actually take all the reef sites and compare them. So these are the sites in red or reef dive sites and compare them at the RVC plots that have been conducted over these years. And when we did this, we were able to pull out all this different data, uh, basically in the same place and over the same time. So in Key Largo, we have data for 25 years, about 2,500 RVC plots um, and about 3,400 sighting records compared to a much actually larger reef uh, sampling effort, which is about 10,000 surveys across 160 sites. So the, da the data, of course, are going to be very different. One's doing sort of random samples of different plots through time, and the other one's doing repeated samples on the same places. But we can account for this. In Key West, we also have good data here, uh, where both reef and the RVC uh, data sets overlap. And this spans about 20 years, starting in 1995 to 2015. So based on these, we can start analyzing the data to figure out, OK, are they going to tell us the same thing about how populations here are changing? But there's an important point that we have to consider. So when we measure a population, we don't really know whether or not we're measuring true population change or whether there's just some element of error. So of course, we have our, our sort of model for how population has changed, or this is what it look, would look like on the R scale, uh, on the log scale, rather. And this is, would be the true population trajectory. But we never actually get the true population. We get an estimate. And, and so that year-to-year -year, uh, sort of change, uh, in this case, over time, would be sort of true demographic change. So we call this process variance, so demographic processes. But the other component here is that there's also going to be additional variance that's, that's, that is basically put in through just measuring things. So this would be our population estimate. We don't get the true population. We get some additional thing with variance around it. And so if you compare these two, we can try and estimate these two components, the different types of error that contribute to what we actually observe from year to year. And we can basically tease these apart statistically. We can also take two different estimates. So in case here and here, so these are two sort of uh, time series where there's both process variance, so the demographic change and the measurement error. And we can see whether or not they actually fit the same sort of underlying population state, so that true population. And then we can test whether or not, okay, these are actually from the same population, but with different sort of levels of measurement error around it or whether or not they're actually two distinctive populations. And based on this, we can kind of use the data to actually say, well, how well statistically do you, does a model where they share a population or they have separate populations actually fit the data that we observed? So this is what we did. And you know it's high, highly uh, cutting edge when it's called state space. So we were able to find pretty good data on population trajectories for about 90 species uh, in Key Largo and Key West. So 85, 85, 86 species in both places. And with the reef data and the RVC data, what we wanted to do is sort of correct for these lurking biases. As I mentioned, the citizen science data, it's opportunistic. There's all these different factors that can influence it. So for RVC, um, it's just the habitat class. So these are defined based on those sort of RVC benthic maps. These would be the patch reefs, your sort of contiguous reef, 
uh, spur and groove, or rubble. We were able to pull out the same habitat classes based on the overlay of the reef sites um, so that we have, can compare them directly. So for RVC, it's just habitat class and then what depth that they went down to, uh, to, to figure out uh, how, how that explains uh, uh, abundance estimates. But for reef, we add all these other things. So there's both site, what site you visited, and the habitat class of that site. There's diver identity, so some people might see more, are more likely to find a fish and other people's less. There's also these kind of sort of temporal clusters in the data. So this is when a bunch of divers go out on the same day at the same site as we've been doing for the past two days, um, where of course they're more likely to see the same sort of things. But we can build all this in to the model. Similarly, we have all these other covariates that represent things like depth, the amount of time people spent surveying, uh, visibility, or whether or not you know, it's an expert or novice observer. And we can sort of build models around this. And what's very interesting is if you actually sort of take all the variance in abundance and you do what's called a sort of variance decomposition, you can figure out you know, what, which of these different factors actually contribute more to what we observe on any given dive. So the two sort of measures of, of how populations are changing, which are in blue here, they're actually a pretty small component of the overall variance in survey abundance. If you compare this to things like site and habitat, site has a very big effect for many species, habitat as well. Uh, diver can have a pretty big effect. Uh, and of course, the actual date, so those te temporal clusters can be big as well. And then for other species, it generally varies for things like depth. Um, but the take home here is that, you know, yeah, the data is messy, but there still is this sort of signal, but most of it is based on, you know, all these other different factors. But when we build that into the model, we can account for that and pull out the temporal signal population change. So what we do then is we build two statistical models. One's modeling the count, uh, in this case of RVC, so those counts in the circular plots. And then we can do that based on an effective year. So this is the average abundance of that, spe of that particular species uh, in that particular year. We also include a, a sort of modeled effective habitat and depth. And with reef, instead of counts, it's these uh, categories of abundance. And what we do is we measure them as probabilities. So when you do repeated surveys, you can then start to estimate, okay, what's the probability that you're gonna be you know, in the 100 plus category versus the one category versus the zero category? So it gives us a sort of probability that sums to one across all these different categories. And with that, we can actually back calculate the expected abundance. So we model those probabilities of observing those different categories according to the, all those different factors that we, that we mentioned. So there's habitat, site. So what this does is it says, okay, I'm gonna know what the, what's the expected number of, those, of that particular species in a particular site consistently over years. Same with, with habitat. What do I expect for the number of, of individuals in a given habitat? We can account for diver, the temporal cluster, and all these different other covariates. And then by sort of conditioning on all these other factors, we can pull out an average effective year that's unaffected by all that other sort of stochastic and uh, 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 variables in the data. And when we kind of build both these models together, we can pull out these year effects and then say, okay, does a year effect in the RVC, so if it's particularly high in one year, particularly low in another year, does that come from the same population trajectory, from the same shared XT here? Or does it come from two different ones? So they're allowed to do their own things. So they either fluctuate together or they fluctuate separately. And here's what this actually looks like. So here's data uh, for the Yellowhead Ras and Key Largo. And you can see the reef data is here in red. And what these points are estimating is this is the estimated year effect. And this dashed line is the shared population state for each of them. So when it differs, it's saying that, okay, this is all measurement error, the difference between the dashed line and here. And same for the RBC, which is in blue. So this is the shared state. You can see it fluctuates together for both of these. So we can compare this combined model where you have, they're sharing the same population state with a separate model where they're allowed to fluctuate independently. So now the model, the, you can see the dashed line has shifted up and it tracks the reef data really closely. What that's telling us is actually there's very little measurement error, according to the statistical model, 
in that population time series from reef. The RVC model is now allow, allowing itself to do its own thing. So this one's capturing different fluctuations, and this one isn't. So we can compare these two statistical models and say, OK, well, how well do these two different model sets actually fit the data? And sometimes it fits really, really well. So here's just a few examples. You can see that you know, the populations in both of these different surveys are really fluctuating together. So you get the same sort of peaks and the same sort of troughs uh, happening over and over. It's actually remarkably congruent in some of these examples. But this isn't necessarily always going to be the case. So we can ask then, OK, uh, now that we've fit all these models, let's pull out the actual average abundance over years and ask, OK, at a very broad scale, so what's the, what's the most common species in reef and how does it compare to the most common species in RBC? We can ask this both across the surveys and across the regions, Key Largo and Key West. So this is showing you um, the comparison between Key Largo and Key West um, for both of these surveys. So this is the RBC up here in blue. And what you can see is that you know, rare species in Key Largo tend to be rare in Key West, and common species in Key Largo tend to be common in Key West. It's the same for reef as well. It's pretty consistent. And this gives you a sort of measure uh, of how consistent that is. So the closer to one it is, the more closely that aligns. You can see uh, in this case, there's some differences in terms of what species tend to be really rare uh, in either survey. So the sort of variance ends up scattering a bit here. But then this is what it looks like when you compare it between the actual surveys in the same place. So the green points are, are populations uh, of, and species where they were best supported by this sort of combined population model. And the yellow ones are where they uh, expect them to actually diverge. But overall, you can see that there's actually pretty good agreement, both in Key Largo, slightly more messy in Key West. But overall, they're telling us pretty similar things about the overall sort of structure of these communities. So when we actually quantify and say, OK, if we use a sort of model testing framework to see which fits better, well, how well do the model fit for all these different species? So the same shared population trajectory, meaning that the data agree on how the population has changed, was supported for about 70% of species in both of these regions, much higher than the 40% we saw in those other studies. But of course, there's still about 30 uh, percent of species or so uh, where they differed. This is one example. So in this case, saying that black grouper has actually fluctuated quite a bit based on the reef data, uh, and in Key Largo, it's really flat. So in this case, the model would say, okay, actually, this seems to be uh, doing separate things. And what's interesting is when you actually look at where these, uh, which species tend to diverge in these regions, uh, they tell potentially very different stories. So the reef data seem to be indicating in many of these, for many of these species in, in these two regions, uh, indicating that there was a pretty big decline over this period from 1993 to 2018. So this is an example with rock beauty. This is the reef butterfly fish. But if you looked at the RVC data and you're relying on this, you wouldn't find much change in this, which seems to be largely flat. Same here. The same thing in Key West, very large declines in some species. Smaller, but still a bit of a decline in, in uh, the RVC data, but not nearly as dramatic. Same here for this other species. So this was very curious, because given that we know that the ecosystem here has changed quite a bit over this period, it's quite sort of surprising to be finding this sort of uh, balance. So we actually tried to quantify this by looking at, OK, let's compare those population trends for those two different models and see how they line up. So in each case, the blue point refers to the RVC trend, and the red point refers to the, the reef trend. So anything that's above zero is increasing over time. Anything that's below zero is decreasing over time. What's interesting is that in about 70% of cases in both regions, the reef data is indicating that the population trends are lower. In many cases, indicating some very strong declines in certain species that are not being estimated in the RVC data. So, which one is real? Well, we can actually sort of test this using our time series statistics um, by basically estimating the proportion of variance, so the proportion of fluctuations that we can attribute either to process or to observation. So that the measurement error or the demographic change. And we can quantify this in the models that we build 
and sort of compare across the two surveys what each one says. So what's very interesting is that the proportion of measurement error uh, in each time series tended to be lower in the reef data. So in about 73 quarters of cases, so the red lines here indicate all examples of species where the measurement error in the reef data is actually lower than the measurement error in the reef visual census from NOAA, uh, in about 75% of cases, uh, they were lower. In, in, and this is also the same in Key West. So this is really interesting. This basically suggests that actually the reef surveys, so these messy opportunistic surveys, are actually more accurately capturing population dynamics. And what's really interesting is that when you actually start comparing these closely, so these are the sort of trends averaged across different families of fish in, in each region. Uh, the red again is reef, blue is RVC, and this purple is sort of the combined measure, is that we're getting very different eco ecological conclusions from these two surveys. If you actually take the population trend and estimate over the 25 years what that adds up to, these are very different estimates. RVC saying hamlets are up 100%, uh, whereas they've declined quite a bit more in the, the reef data. Uh, similarly, there's many cases where uh, the differences are massive. And so what this means is that we're getting very different conclusions from these two surveys. And this uh, means that we're probably revealing otherwise cryptic population change and population decline that otherwise is not being noted by these other surveys. So just to get us all up to speed here, again, we really don't have a good grasp on how populations uh, and are changing in most of the world. Citizen science, though, is really amassing data at massive scales now. And this is, has a ton of potential to fill this biodiversity data gap. The reef citizen science surveys are actually really effective at popu uh, tracking populations uh, relative to structured surveys. And indeed, they may actually be more accurate than these structured surveys and have potential to reveal some sort of cryptic population change that otherwise is going unnoticed. So this means that citizen science data has, can potentially be leveraged to actually make better decisions and actually do evidence-based management. So as we mentioned before, there's numerous small-scale fisheries that are operating with essentially no data. And policy and management decisions are still being made, but they're being made naively. Of course, there's many other species that aren't actually harvested, but they're species of conservation concern that we also just aren't tracking. And we may lose them entirely without being able to respond. And of course, bad decisions thrive in this uncertainty. Uh, but an unrelated topic, let's talk about Goliath grouper. Um, so as, as many of you know, uh, Goliath grouper essentially went nearly extinct here uh, after some very heavy overfishing uh, throughout the sort of latter half of the 20th century. Um, so this is the sort of estimate of harvest and commercial fisheries and then recreational um, in Florida from the stock assessment in 2016. And of course, in 1990, uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, sort of put on this harvest moratorium, so it was no longer could be fished commercially. Um, but this has been sort of challenged recently, uh, which is unfortunate because Florida is really the last stronghold for this species in the world. It's rarely found in all of its past range. Uh, and Florida actually has some of the best abundance um, because it has actually recovered since 1990, but not fully recovered. Now, this is the history of how things have changed uh, with management over time. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Goliath grouper basically became overfished. That's very easy to happen with a long-lived, slow-maturing species. That's also relatively easy to fish because it aggregates on a, sites and is very, goes to the same sites new, uh, consistently over time. It's very easy to overfish it. Uh, in 1990, the harvest moratorium came in. Uh, and of course, there's been many other decisions along the way, but the big one was the stock assessment in 2016 that was ultimately rejected because they actually couldn't really make strong conclusions from it. But despite that stock assessment being rejected, there's been these sort of numerous attempts to lift the moratorium. Uh, in 2018, they, they had a discussion around this. They ultimately decided to continue research and reassess status in 2022. 
But then they jumped the boat a little bit and decided, well, maybe we'll try opening it again just this past May. So it was right around then that we actually heard about this. And thankfully, I'd been working on this other study trying to match together these different data sets. And we said, OK, well, let's take that same model that we built that we know is pretty accurate, that we know can track populations pretty well, and apply it to Goliath Grouper. So what we were able to do is take about 18,000 citizen science surveys from about 130 sites where Goliath Grouper were consistently cited over time all across Florida. So here's just some examples. And using that same sort of modeling approach that I explained where we estimate the population trajectory uh, while controlling for all those other variables, we came up with this. So this goes back to 1994. So this is when you know, the moratorium was just coming in. Goliath Grouper were very, very rare. Of course, they started actually coming back. So this meant that the moratorium was doing a good job uh, at increasing the, the population abundance right up until about 2010, where all of a sudden it starts tanking again. So this is really interesting. And you know, this, there's been other studies as well on this and other data that's contributed to Goliath Grouper that suggests a very similar thing. Um, part of the suspected reasons is things like cold, cold kill events, red tide poisoning, and of course, they rely on mangrove habitat for the juveniles to be reared, and mangroves aren't doing that great. Um, so we submitted this data uh, to the FWC, and what we calculated is that actually since 2010, with this supposedly recovered population, is actually it's declined by about 50%. That's a lot. We can break it down by region as well. So the Florida Keys are very well surveyed, of course. Um, so we had 50, 58 dive sites here. It's really bad in the Florida Keys. Declined by about 70%. Uh, this, this sort of shaded uh, bars represent the uncertainty around all those estimates. And if you calculate the uncertainty, it's still declined by about half to maybe 90% since 2010. This is a very strong decline. On the East Coast, it's slightly different. There's a lot less surveys there. Um, but basically what it suggests is, you know, up until 2010, it was increasing, then it's just sort of flat lines. But the really important thing to take home about this, and, you know, some people have been, you know, questioning this, and I would question it as well, because look at all this uncertainty. So if you actually calculate the uncertainty, sure, maybe it's basically flat lines since 2010, which also isn't great. Um, but as far as we know, it actually could have declined about 40% or be up double. So we can't really conclude too much from this data on the East Coast. But we can be very confident that in Florida Keys, Goliath grouper are way, way less abundant in the past decade. So we submitted all this data to them. Uh, it didn't make it into their presentation, um, but this is what they presented. So, you know, here's some other data that they include. So this is sort of angler surveys um, from fishermen in, in the Everglades Park um, and other recreational catch um, where they can do sort of catch per unit effort. And this is the trend over time. So just like, like uh, some of ours, it's like we, you'll see these sort of peaks right around the mid 2000s. Um, I guess they, they just honed in on this data point and got really excited and decided to open it. Um, but if you look at the adult indices, so this is older reef data. So this is from the, the stock assessment report in 2016. They didn't bother to actually look at it to 2020. Um, we did, uh, and we sent it to them. Um, but you can see again, right up until 2010, seems to be relatively fine, but not doing that great since then. So this is the data they use, and ultimately they decided that, yeah, we're going to go ahead and start fishing it. So this is the rules they've proposed. So up to 20, uh, 200, rather, Goliath Grouper per year, uh, and it's a sort of lottery system. So you can put in the lottery for $10 and get a permit for one for $500. Uh, it's limited to just juveniles, so 20 to 36 inches. Um, and has a you know, certain harvest season, and they've sort of closed off the harvest uh, in the, these areas. Um, so this is what they're going ahead with right now. Uh, what effect this will have, we don't really know. Uh, it could be fine, it could be a low level, it could be disastrous, because we don't really have a good measure of the actual total abundance of the species here. It's a pretty hard uh, species to survey, and really the reef data is some of the best data for it which doesn't exactly give a ringing endorsement for opening up this harvest. And of course, targeting juveniles, we may not actually see the effect of this policy choice in about set six or eight years. We don't really know. So it remains a sort of experiment, I guess, that is being conducted. What's exciting, though, is we can use this reef data to inform management and really pinpoint how things are changing. So we can document, for instance, 
uh, the sites along this rise phase where, where sites were increasing. And we can calculate population trends across all the different sites that people were diving at over time. So the red here indicates areas where they actually didn't increase, but they declined over this time. And everything that isn't red, basically, so from orange to blue, are sites where, in some cases, they've increased a lot. In other cases, they've increased mildly. Let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, so in this early phase, actually, there were some still clusters of sites declining, for instance, in the Dry Tor Cartugas, uh, also a few sites in Key West, uh, and some mixed bags here around Key Largo, and also sort of near Miami. And then really importantly, we can also document in the last 10 years where things seem to be particularly bad. So now, basically everything that um, isn't blue is a site, is a population and a site that's declining. Uh, and most of them are. And let's zoom in on some of the worst places again. So dry to Tortugas though has actually seemed to have rebounded a little bit since the early, earlier declines. Uh, Key West still declining, Key Largo really declining. And again, that sort of mixed bag on the East Coast. So this sort of framework to analyze how populations are changing at these big scales and sort of seeing the trajectory is quite useful. And then this is also really useful for starting to potentially dig into the actual mechanisms and where things to be seem to be worst. So we're really excited to start rolling this out to all sorts of different places and all sorts of different species. And we are sort of taking the reef data to all the different new frontiers and applying this framework that we've built. So one of our exciting new projects will be working with the Sea Doc Society, uh, looking at population changes, the Salish Sea. I actually live right around here. So this is particularly exciting for me. Uh, and we'll be applying these sort of population trajectories that we've now validated against structured survey data and shown that not only are they uh, uh, agree with it, but they're even you know, doing a better job at capturing the population dynamics. And we're gonna potentially reveal some interesting patterns of biodiversity change that I don't think are on people's radar. This is just one example that I don't think anyone would have uh, expected this, but you know, this species, this sort of sculpin just seems to be dis disappearing from sites in the Salish Sea over time. So we're really excited to start turning out this sort of new data framework we have to all sorts of different places and to get lots of information on how things are actually changing. And I do believe that reef is really at the forefront of monitoring biodiversity in our oceans. It really has the best long-term data available for, co for most of Earth's coastal ecosystems. And of course, you know, we've just talked about this little part here, but reef is global in scale. And many of these places have very little population monitoring data. We've shown that citizen scienti scientists, you guys, are actually really effective ecological sentinels. And when we combine that with our modeling techniques, we can get really high quality data from this. So I think that really the reef data set is going to be a really crucial record uh, about how everything is changing in our oceans and how different species are faring in this human dominated world. With that, I have many people to thank. Uh, I'll start with Christy and Bryce for bringing me into the reef world. Uh, this has been an amazing project to work on. It feels like probably some of the most meaningful work I've done to date and probably will ever do. Uh, and so I thank them immensely for giving me this opportunity to even work with this. Uh, I'd also like to thank Jeremiah Blondo who helped uh, with the RBC data uh, on, on that first study. And of course, Really, I mean, Ned's talk last night really hammered it home. I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. So thank you to all the people that have built Reef into what it is today. It's an amazing resource and it's incredibly impressive. And it's gonna reveal some very exciting things. And of course, thanks to many of you, and probably most of you in this audience and beyond, uh, who've built this with your effort. All these thousands of citizen scientists that have contributed to this remarkable collective uh, effort that is really gonna change things. Thank you all for listening, and uh, I look forward to taking any questions. The changes of Goliath Grouper potentially up in Palm Beach, Beach County could uh, the increase that you saw actually in that population there could could be due to the increase in dive charters going out to the spawning sites there? Do you look at survey numbers? So, I mean, it's an interesting question. Basically with the statistical framework that we use, the increased numbers shouldn't actually affect things because 
it gives you sort of more resolution on the data, but it shouldn't necessarily bias it towards finding more or less. That's because we basically know that, okay, if people are going to a particular site and black grouper is there, we can basically estimate, okay, well, how many do you expect to find at that site, right? So even if there's sort of more survey effort, it'll just sort of like improve the precision around that estimate rather than actually making it go up or go down. But if they hadn't found the spawning sites before that, I, I don't actually know the history of when the dive charter started taking people to the spawning sites, but that could really impact it because the numbers are obviously going to be. Right. So if there are like new sites that get added in. Yeah. So if new sites get added in, and I guess the question is if, if they get added in, but they're particularly biased towards being really, really hyper abundant or something. That probably could have some effect, but I still think that the, the modeling technique, as long as it's been sampled uh, frequently enough, um, and again, we in this in the case with the that particular data is, you know, most of these sites, uh, there was a certain threshold for the number of years that they covered. I think it was like maybe five years or something like that. So it's it's enough time to estimate, okay, yeah, there's a new black grouper site, but we know this is a really high uh, abundance site. So it still will fit that sort of effect of that. Would there be any benefit to adding a size uh, metric to the, the reef survey methodology, either in terms of uh, more accurately comparing it to the, the onsec bondurant? Yeah, I mean, size is definitely really valuable information. I guess the question is, though, is you know how accurate can you know people estimate that size without? technology. As Bryce's talk uh, yesterday showed, um, we now have some pretty impressive technology, and indeed that could potentially be turned into this. Um, so potentially with the sort of aid of technology, yeah, that could maybe be incorporated someday. And that would definitely be very important information for adding into managing these species. Hey, Dan. <clears throat> I have a quick question it relates to Palm Beach. Do you stay away from aggregation time periods that would tend to bias your data, or do you factor that in or out? Yeah, so actually that's a great question. We actually decided um, for this analysis that we just omitted all the aggregations um, because, yeah, we people could be finding more aggregations and that could actually make it go up, but it was just easier to do okay, non-aggregative sites uh, to see how it's sort of like, how it's changing on your average reef or, or rec dive site, right? So the difference in process uh, error between the yep. different data sets that you combined is one fascinating. I'm, I'm curious if you have any speculation on what's different between the survey processes that might have led to that? Is it that reef surveyors are more able to look in little cracks and crevices in the other data set, which you might be able to see in species? Or Yeah, that's a great question, um, which I didn't get into. Uh, but thank you for asking that. Yeah, so it's really interesting when you think about it, right? So there's, these are two different strategies. One is visit the same place repeatedly. Well, not the same place, but the same places repeatedly um, versus in the RVC data, it's like visit it once per year. So that doesn't work so well if populations have really high spatial structure. So fish are really like quite um, heter distributed very unevenly across that landscape. If you just happen to put plots on the sites that they like, uh, then you may say, oh, it's really high up this year. And then the next year, randomly sample and it's on kind of crappy sites, then you're not going to find that. But by visiting the same places over time repeatedly, uh, you get a much finer estimate of, you can model in that spatial structure so you can actually account for it. Um, and then you can see it get a much more precise uh, sort of estimate of, of the temporal change. So I think that's the main difference. And I think that's actually, you know, uh, a very great benefit of the reef data because of course, many of these species are gonna be very heter, you know, distributed very unevenly across uh, the landscape as they like particular sites and particular habitats. So is, is anyone comparing uh, basically the effects of a human being taking the measurement as opposed to a robot or not a human in the, in the water? Because the minute we go in with the bubbles and we're disturbing everything and there's no way not to. So the animals are gonna behave differently, perhaps dramatically differently when we're around as opposed to when we're not around. Yeah, I mean, 
I don't know of any long-term robot data sets yet, but we might be able to revisit that in two or three decades. But um, yeah, I don't know. There could be, you know, our ROV surveys are potentially uh, that could be compared. I, I don't think though that, that those sort of longer, because really you need the long-term data to ask this sort of question, right? Like you can't do it with even five years of data. You can't do it with 10 years of data because there's not enough power there to tease it apart. So I don't think we're quite there yet. But potentially one day, if they happen to sort of be in the same areas in the same time span, you could test that as well. But so far, as I haven't seen anything that has uh, explicitly sort of compared that for um, fish surveys or, or any other group. So I see that we're, we're counting numbers of fish, but is there any other studies that that study the reasons that the fish are, you know, numbers increase or decrease, like water quality, or you know, uh, are there universities being involved or other scientists being involved? Uh, well, in terms of the RBC data set, the Reef Visual Census by NOAA, um, I'm not particularly sure on that, but I, I haven't seen anything on it. Um, that said, so our framework for, for sort of analyzing the data, like we're, we're just scratching the surface here. So this was all about validating the data and showing that actually a reef is super, super valuable as a way to track population change. Now that we've done that, we can start expanding this out to all number of questions. So we can ask, okay, is that population fluctuation in a year where it went to the population crashed? Was that tied to an event like a climate event or changes to the terrestrial landscape around the site or something else like that, we can start pulling all that data together now and actually start asking some really interesting questions about what's not just what is the trend, but also what's driving it. So that's amongst the many sort of directions that we're going to potentially go with this. Um, and yeah, this is just this is just the beginning, really. Dan, you were able to show you know, the comparisons between the reef and the RVC that 70-ish percent of the time they agree, 30 percent of the time they don't. And when they don't, it seems that the reef data are better at answering the questions you're trying to ask than RVC data. So let's go back to the eBird versus the Bird International data, where they only agree 40 percent of the time. So the other 60 percent of the time, is eBird better or the scientific surveys? Well, so they didn't do it in the same framework. So in the sense of being able to estimate whether or not the change over time is due to measurement error or due to this sort of like demographic process. So this is why this is sort of a leading edge of statistical models to really pull apart these things. So um, they, they can't really say, um, but I think this is really like one of the most sort of integrative ways of, of asking this question that's been done uh, as of yet. So maybe they'll ask that after they see this. Dan, uh, a few years ago, I interviewed Dr. Craig Hilton Taylor, who's the head of the Red List in, in uh, England, the IUCN. I thought your presentation was fantastic. And I wonder if you supply or can in the future supply a lot of data to the red list, which recently changed the Goliath grouper from critically endangered to vulnerable, not because they were getting more abundant, but rather because they tightened up their definitions of what those things are. The reef data is fantastic, and your presentation was great. Do you work with those kind of groups? Thanks. Yeah, so... This is the sort of interesting thing that's going to be coming up with our new project on the Salish Sea is that working with the Sea Doc Society explicitly, one of the things that we want to do is build. So we built this framework. We're, we're kind of aiming at all the data in this area. And the next step is getting in government agencies of for, and this is a transboundary thing too. So there'll be, you know, Canadian government agencies, provincial, federal, uh, and in the state of Washington, Oregon, getting all these people together, introducing them to what we're actually able to generate from the reef data. And I do hope and think that this will be a massive resource for uh, government agencies and non-governmental ones like the IUCN. So we're basically, you know, again, just starting the process and it's going to build into some a resource that I hope many different uh, agencies are going to use.
Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Let's give him a round. Appreciate it. Uh, I think that concludes our activities for the evening. Are there any important announcements, my lovely wife? Um, okay, yes. Thank you, Dan. That was amazing. It's been really, um, we've, it's been great. We've been wanting to find someone who could start to do the, this type of work that Dan's doing for a while. And so we've been um, really excited to work with him. And just like he said, it's just barely scratching the surface. So many more good stories to come from that. So yes, this concludes our seminars for this year. We're really excited. They, they were all live streamed and recorded. So if you missed any of them or you want to share them with someone else, they're on the um, Facebook page. They're also on the Reef YouTube page. So they'll be there forever. So if anybody, if you want to share any of these talks with anyone else, you can go to our YouTube is youtube.com slash we speak fish altogether. And then on the main reef Facebook page, they're under the videos. Um, so they'll be there forever. So that's great. And so now we will break. We're going to um, head over to the, um, the Bayside property. The, as I said, the, the gates open in about an hour. So you have a little bit of time. You can, um, we're going to start to clean up out here and head over. But um, if you need to go, you know, freshen up and then we'll see you at, uh, for the love of the sea. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye.